I've said it before and I'll say it again. Fallout is weird. It's probably the best one-word descriptor for the franchise. Weird. And it's weird throughout. The setting is weird of course, but also, and I mean this in the nicest way, the fans, including myself, are weird. The devs are weird. Some of the gameplay and lore decisions are weird. That's just the way it is. And I wouldn't change a single thing about it. Now, with a franchise that is so weird, there is of course going to be some really weird things that have, one way or another, become canon. Let's go over a few of them today. This is 8 crazy pieces of Fallout lore that I can't believe are canon. Number 1. Urine Recycling Power armor is some of the most iconic armor in all of gaming, and what would this massive metal suit be without a couple perks? Imagine this, you're on the front lines of a heated battle in a war that has been deadlocked for a decade. To stay strong and hydrated you've been taking down copious amounts of water, can't afford to be dehydrated these days, that's a no-no. But wait, all of a sudden you get this churning feeling in your bladder, you've taken on too much water, and now nature is calling. Uh oh, what exactly are you supposed to do? Well, one of the right children asks the chosen one this exact question. Verbatim they ask, how do you go pee pee in that thing? And it's the chosen one's response that makes this one of the many unbelievable facts in the universe's canon. They respond, haha, <laughs> actually I just urinate in the armor and it recycles everything. Isn't that interesting? Do you know what recycling means, little one? It's so considerate for the chosen one to ask if they know what recycling means too. After all, they were likely never taught the three R's, reduce, reuse, recycle. Anyways, it would seem that certain, if not all types of power armor contain its own contained human waste recycling systems, able to take human waste, put it through several filters and purification processes, then feed it back ready to be drunk once again. And I only say ready to be drunk again, as generic paladin dialogue offers up a little factoid saying that, did you know you could survive for weeks without water in a suit of powered armor? The only way I can see this being possible is if the power armor recycling systems feed the filtered and purified water back to the wearer. It's very Bear Grylls-esque, right? But if you do find yourself in a survival situation, the optics of drinking your own urine is probably the least of your concerns. And besides, I've seen enough Survivor Man to know that not having to find a source of clean water is a major relief when it comes to these sorts of situations. But yeah, some power armor models recycle your own urine. It's weird? but it's maybe not the weirdest. Number 2. Anime Exists Did you know that anime exists in Fallout? It certainly shouldn't surprise anyone as, you know, why wouldn't it exist? But I do find it strange that the Fallout games have canonized the existence of anime. What was once an assumption about the Japanese style of animated works has been confirmed to exist within Fallout. New Reno is the biggest little city in the world, built upon the remains of the pre-war city of Reno. Shocking, I know. Reno is known as the capital of sin, featuring no local government or police force. Instead, a series of four crime families, the Mordinos, Bishops, Wrights, and the Salvatoras, keep the city lawless, free, and safe. As such, many shady businesses and business practices have come about. Gambling, prize fighting, chem production, and prostitution, to name a few. Well, a generic line of dialogue spoken by a new Reno worker makes reference to anime, if the Chosen One approaches one of these workers while wearing a suit of power armor, they have a chance to say, I think I saw this same situation in an anime video once. Bam. And just like that, anime, and maybe more explicitly, hen exists in Fallout. Now, I'm not exactly sure what anime video she's referring to, but if someone could, I don't know, point me in the right direction or something, that would be much appreciated. You know, for research purposes, of course. Number 3. The Ghost Fleet this is one of the coolest bits of Fallout lore to me. So the Switchboard was a top secret base of operations for the United States Defense Intelligence Agency. One of their many projects included the manufacturing of an advanced robot that could use algorithms and formulas to predict the future, and hopefully turn the tide in the ongoing Sino-American conflict. Predictive Analytic Machine, or PAM as it was known, would offer up regular reports regarding various outcomes and situations that could potentially arise during the war. One of these reports was regarding something called the Ghost Fleet. In an official record dated December 17th, 2075, a conversation between Pam, a general, and an operator is transcribed. In the conversation, Pam posits that because Chinese stealth technologies are so much more advanced than that of the United States, they believe that China would be able to conceal a sizable research project from American intelligence. Pam concludes that China has a 91% chance of having conducted large-scale experimentation with their stealth tech. 
When asked to clarify, Pam goes on to say that it's likely that China has been testing its stealth tech with their submarines in something called the Ghost Fleet. They mention that this aligns with previous intelligence reports that were made back in November that same year. When asked if Pam could confirm this hypothesis or theory, they state that a second order of approximation would be inconclusive and that the assumptions have a bit too much variability. This sort of contradicts what was previously said, but for a machine, 91% and absolute certainty are quite different, so I suppose it's fair. The takeaway is that it's extremely likely that China was working on a fleet of nigh invisible submarines to employ in the Sino-American War. And sure, while we've seen past Chinese submarines in the games, namely the Yangtze 31 and the sunken submarine in Point Lookout, it's uncertain if these vessels were part of the Ghost Fleet and able to use stealth technology similar to the Stealth Suit and Stealth Boy. But the fact that there's a 91% chance that China had or was producing true stealth submarines is extremely cool. Where the US had their might and used brute force, China contested the good old US of A with their stealth and were quite sneaky deaky like. Oh, and I feel like I should mention that if you're ever curious as to how Fallout stealth technology actually works, you should go check out my video from two weeks ago. I go over how the stealth boy and Chinese stealth armor works. Oh, and its real life counterpart as well. I think it's pretty cool. Number 4. Real Ghosts Now for something that is even more invisible than stealth tech, and that would be dead people. Wait a minute. Ooh, that didn't sound very good. Um, what I'm trying to say is that real ghosts exist in the Fallout universe. I think Fallout prides itself on its science fiction, and I think it does a good job with that. And so when the game forgoes its wacky science explanations and just embraces the weird, supernatural, and mysterious elements of the game, it makes for a really fun and unique experience. Learning how things work inside the universe is great, but also just embracing the unknown aspects of it is extremely fun. So the fact that two confirmed real ghost sightings exist in Fallout makes for a great experience. I feel like I've mentioned both characters a few times over already, notably in my Cryptids video, but also in my Grandchester family video as well, so I'll be a bit brief. The first ever ghost sighting in Fallout is Anna Winslow from Fallout 2. That's like what now, three things from Fallout 2? I guess that would probably rank it as the top, uh, weirdest game in the Fallout franchise. Anyway, not much is known about Anna Winslow outside of the fact that her ghostly apparition haunts the den's west side, and the only way to return the troubled woman back to the spirit realm is by returning her locket after a young chem dealer named Joey had stolen the priceless heirloom. Once the locket is returned to Anna's gravesite, she's able to rest in peace. The second ghost appears in Fallout 4's Nuka World DLC. As the sole survivor approaches the Grandchester Mystery Mansion, they may notice a young girl standing in one of the windows. This strange lady is none other than the infamous Lucy Granchester. Lucy was the daughter of Morticia and Hannibal Granchester. The family's legend states that one night Lucy killed her parents and was subsequently put in a mental institution. On the girl's 18th birthday, she escaped the facility where she returned to her childhood home and was discovered hanging in the attic nine days later. Now, Lucy not only appears in the window, but actually several times throughout the sole survivor's trek through the now defunct attraction only fully going away after walking through a door, which, freakily enough, opens to a wooden wall. But such is the life of being a ghost, doors and walls can't contain the supernatural. Ghosts are real, at least they are in the Fallout universe, and as a believer of the paranormal, I think that's pretty neat. Number 5. Weaponized Cola Speaking of Nuka World, let's take a moment to thank its founder, John Caleb Bradburn, for adding one of the most psychotic things anyone could ever think of to the universe of Fallout. Weaponized Cola. How is this actually a thing, by the way? Well, the honest answer goes back to, unsurprisingly, the United States military's obsession with arms manufacturing and turning just about everything into a weapon. So, at the end of the day, why not make lethal pop too? Dubbed Project Cobalt, Brad Burton loaned out his genius organic chemists to General Braxton in exchange for accessing the government's life prolognation program, LeapX. While Brad Burton prepped for the upcoming apocalypse, his beverage years would research and try to develop the most powerful chemical and biological weapons known to man. After seven months of hard work, they finally had a breakthrough. The team came up with a custom isotope based on strontium-90 that they called Quantum. This isotope, according to the team, could weaponize nearly anything. It could store incoming energy on armor, and even amplify the energy of standard munitions. We see this in-game through the Nuka Nuke launcher and its accompanying ammunition, the Nuka Nukes, as well as through the Quantum X01 power armor. Believe me when I say this, Quantum was, for lack of a better term, 
pretty cracked. Oh, and I feel like I should also mention that in addition to making armor safer and weapons stronger, it made drinks tastier, at least according to Nuka Cola themselves. The reality was that it was quite the dangerous beverage and was slightly radioactive. You probably shouldn't drink it. Number 6. Immortality Now if you want to drink as much Nuka Cola Quantum in the world as possible, try becoming immortal. Yep, immortality exists within the Fallout canon. I'm not only talking about how ghouls don't age, there are also normal humans like you or me that are just immortal one way or another, though it's usually thanks to advanced technology or some ancient relic of sorts. I'll start with the technology side of things and then we'll dive into the more interesting immortal relic bits after. So there have been quite a few incidents of people being able to prolong their life indefinitely through the use of advanced technologies. There are the more crude versions of immortality through implanting one's brain into a robot, like the Vault 118 Dwellers, or even the Think Tank at the Big Empty. Another crude form is John Caleb Bradburton's Leap X Gizmo, where only his head is stored in a jar, being kept alive using advanced biomechanical engineering. After that, there are the Vision Tron stasis pods that are being employed by Dr. Stanislaus Braun in the Vault 112 Dwellers. These folks are being kept alive through the pod's stasis device, prolonging their lives for an indefinite amount of time. In a sort of similar vein are Robert House's modifications that he made to himself. House fitted himself with the best and latest life preservation technology money could buy. And while he looks more draugr than human, the man is still alive and kicking at the ripe old age of 261. If we move on to the more fantastical side of things, the entire Cabot family in the Commonwealth is well over 400 years old by now. Born in 1835, Lorenzo Cabot was an archaeologist with a keen interest in ancient civilizations. On an expedition to Rubal Kali, Lorenzo found a mysterious crown that granted him supernatural powers. But as powerful as the crown was, it also broke Lorenzo's mind. Thus, upon his return to Boston, Lorenzo was indefinitely institutionalized at the Parsons State Insane Asylum at the hands of his own son. This was for the safety of Lorenzo and those around him. Jack Cabot would then commit his life to researching the strange artifact that sat atop his father's head. In that time, he would manage to develop a serum out of his father's blood that would demonstrate anti-aging properties and could even reverse the effects of aging. This serum is the key to the Cabot family's immortality. But Lorenzo's ancient crown isn't the only artifact that was able to provide immortality, no. Constance Blackhall was the sister of the Dunwich building's owner, Robert Dunwich. And while some of the occult stuff in Point Lookout is a bit um, questionable when it comes to their canonicity, Constance Blackhall's existence is confirmed. Both siblings shared an interest in the occult, and so she would use her late husband's immense wealth to acquire the ancient relic known as the Crow of Beckney. Using this tome, Constance would become something of a cult leader in the Point Lookout region, and with this book, Constance would manage to live an unnaturally long life. That is until the Crow of Beckney was stolen from her, and she would pass away not long after. But for the time that she had the ancient text, Constance was seemingly immortal. Not everyone gets to live forever, but for these individuals it would seem that they do, whether they like it or not. And that's just a few examples of immortality canonized throughout the Fallout franchise. Number 7. The Think Tank Are Flat Earthers This one is a bit of a fun one. When first meeting the crazed Think Tank members, Dr. Klein has a line of dialogue where he says, What is this, a high school science fair? Get your act together, you're making us look like a collection of round earthers. Using the term round earther as the punchline leads me to believe that the think tank must be flat earthers, which honestly seems pretty on brand for the group. Think about it, if they're down to make the Cazadors trauma harnesses and the suits that the Sierra Madre ghosts wear, then they certainly must be lacking something in the brains department. To add to this, if the group has been stuck in the big empty for centuries and their whole world is just this whole dome, then by all appearances their world would just be a flat circle, right? I don't know, it's just a fun little tidbit of canonized Fallout lore. Perfect for trivia night. Number 8. Intelligent Animals And the last one I'll talk about is the fact that the world has quite a few intelligent animals. I'll start with the most well known. In 2235, the Enclave performed a wide variety of experiments on the deadly Death Claw. One of these included exposing them to FEV. This exposure increased the creature's intelligence and provided them with the ability to speak. The hope was that they would be smart enough to understand and obey a series of orders, making them deadly soldiers ready to do the group's bidding. What they didn't expect, though, was that they would grow to doubt the morality of their masters. You know it's bad when even Deathclaws think that the Enclave are the bad guys. After aiding the Enclave with the capturing of the Vault 13 dwellers, the Deathclaws would abandon the group and take residence in the now empty Vault. The faction would thrive in the Vault, alongside several new humans that moved in, until they were all massacred by Frank Horrigan and his team. 
Outside of intelligent death claws, there's also Brain, the intelligent mole rat cult leader. I made a short about him some time back. Brain was the leader of the ghoul renewal cult of Gecko. In exchange for helping him conquer the world, he would try to reverse the effects of ghoulification, promising to transform his ghoul followers back into humans. There's also the Professor's Rad Scorpion. They are an intelligent Rad Scorpion that is really frickin' good at chess. And then there is Seymour, an intelligent talking spore plant who can help the Chosen One beat the smart Rad Scorpion at chess. Yeah, Fallout 2 is definitely the weirdest Fallout. But that, my friends, is eight of the weirdest pieces of Fallout lore. If you can think of any more, teleportation. Let me know in the comments and perhaps I'll put together a part two. But that's all from me today, folks. If you liked the video, be sure to share and subscribe. Have a good rest of your day. Cheers. What is this, a high school science fair? Get your act together. You're making us look like a collection of round earthers.